But unlike other founding fathers, Hamilton did, made no real effort to preserve his papers. He didn't keep a letter book. He didn't keep a diary. He frequently didn't keep letters he received because he cared more about the opinion of his contemporaries than he cared about what posterity said of him and because he didn't live long enough to reach a reflective old age as did Adams and Jefferson, he did very little to assure his place in history. His wife, Elizabeth Hamilton, on the other hand, did, but she did it very selectively, and she destroyed a good deal of material. After his death, she embarked on a mission to gather his papers and promote his achievements. This was difficult in the age of Jefferson and Jackson, but she succeeded in 18, I think in 1826. She succeeded in getting Congress to authorize $26,000 to purchase all the Hamilton material she had collected. And she then badgered her son, John Church, into editing his father's papers. John Church did this uh, very carefully. His transcripts are among the most accurate we have. Unfortunately, he didn't annotate anything. Later on, Henry Cabot Lodge uh, prepared an edition of Hamilton's papers that has more annotations and includes some new material like the pamphlet on the Reynolds affair. But um, he was sloppy in his transcriptions and Surrett found a lot of mistakes in, the, in his work. Now for our edition, oh by the way, I think we have a beautiful one of Elizabeth. For our edition, Surrett ultimately collected 19,000 documents. Most came from the Library of Congress and the National Archives, sizable holdings from the expected historical societies in New York and Connecticut and Massachusetts. But he also learned material was available in some very strange places. Glassboro State College, the American Swedish Historical Society, and Father Flanagan's Boys Home. In a time before the internet, he wrote 4,000 of these letters that you see up there now. This is a carbon. He wrote 4,000 letters to libraries, institutions, and individual manuscript owners. We reviewed auction catalogs on a regular basis to see what was being sold. If we couldn't get a copy of the letter or if we weren't uh, able to find out who purchased the letter, then we printed the entry from the dealer's catalog in the papers just to show that we knew such a letter existed. Most owners of private manuscripts were generous. Some refused on the grounds that it devalued their holding if it was published. Hamilton's now hot, so we're seeing a lot of this material crop up on the auction market. Surrett spoke to book clubs. He spoke to women's clubs, to all sorts of places where someone would contact us and say, I've got a document, but the price of a copy is that you come speak to our club about your work. Uh, we searched footnotes in books. We went through holdings in foreign archives. We have material from the Canadian archives, the British Museum, the Royal Library in Stockholm, and ultimately the Hermitage where somebody found copies of two Hamilton letters and the deal was we gave them a full set of the papers in return for those copies. There's probably more material. I suspect there's material in the Netherlands as Hamilton was attorney for the Holland Land Company. I think the Lafayette family may still have material that hasn't been released. We never found a missing store of John Church papers, not his son, but his wife's brother-in-law, his wife Betsy, had a wife, Angelica, a very famous woman in late 18th century America. Her husband, John Church, was a British businessman. There was a store of papers in a house somewhere in England that was cited in a book published in the late 1800s. Um, one of Dr. Surrett's grandsons, David, used to do a lot of research in England in the summer, and David was sent to the house. Uh, current owners didn't know anything about it. They tried a million different ways to find out who had lived in the house. We were never able to find it. That would be an interesting collection, 
just from the point of view of John Church's place in, in history at that time. He crossed between the United States and England. He had friends on both sides. And he was an intimate of a lot of people who were in, in positions of power. Um, I think also the New York Post. Hamilton was an avid essayist. He was quick to put pen to paper. We suspect that many of the articles in the New York Post in the early years were written by him, but we have no record of it, and the New York Post claims to have no archive. And then there were these crazy moments that came up. At one point, Surrette was in Washington. I believe it was for actually a luncheon at the White House of several of the project editors. This was under John Kennedy. And his wife and one of his sons went to Washington, and they were, they were sightseeing. And they walked into the National Archives. And as I got the story, Patsy just blurted out, oh my god, that's Hamilton's handwriting. And there indeed in a display case was a copy of the Constitution. Hamilton had signed it. But also, for some reason we don't know, all of the states were in his handwriting, the names of the states above which the different signers signed their names. And so she blurted this out. And a guard came over, and she tried to explain. <laughs> and finally, he said, well, where is your husband? And she said, having lunch at the White House. And he said, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't until the next day that they were able to, to uh, open the case, pull the document out, and get us a copy. Less successful, but sort of exciting, was the disappointing Hamilton trunk. Now, Hamilton's last direct descendant was Alexander Hamilton IV, Sandy Hamilton. And he'd been very generous to the project. He'd given us access to everything he had, and Columbia had purchased a good deal of the material. And both Surrett and Ken Loff, who was head of Columbia's rare book room in those days, believed there was nothing else that Sandy had. So it was a surprise when, after he died, his wife called up and said she found another trunk in the safe in the Morgan Guarantee Building. It was unopened. It had the original twine around it. Did Columbia want it in return for a tax deduction? And she, wanted, she didn't want us to buy it. She just wanted a write-off. Well, there were many conversations between Surrett and Ken Loff. Usually they started with, there can't be anything here. Sandy gave us everything. And they ended with, but oh my god, what if? And so in the end, they bought it, or they gave her the appraisal. And I still remember the day that the trunk arrived, and Surrett and I trooped over there, and Ken Loff tried to open the cord, and it wouldn't unknot. And finally, he said, don't tell anybody I ever did this, and he just took an X-Acto blade. And within five minutes, three faces fell to the floor because there really was nothing in there. <laughs> there was a lock of Hamilton's hair and a lot of books. Now, there's been speculation that the books form part of Hamilton's library. It is possible some of the older books did, but it is likelier it's the library of his son, John Church, or possibly his grandson, Alexander McLean. The books are still up on deposit at Columbia. As the project went on and Surrett realized the extent and complexity and importance of the papers relating to Hamilton's legal practice, he realized he didn't feel comfortable being the editor of that material. And so Julius Gerbel at the Columbia Law School was brought on board. Julius eventually passed away and, and the project was completed under Joe Smith. That's five volumes. My favorite Julius Gerbel story, I don't know if there's anybody here from Columbia Law School. Julius had a very tough reputation. He was not a popular teacher. He was a great scholar, but he had a rough teaching method. And I was warned. Before Surrett sent me over there the first time, he warned me. And I said, don't worry. I studied at Hunter College as an undergrad, and Julius's wife was chairwoman of the Hunt History Department. And she hired a lot of the people who taught me, so it should all be OK. And I went over, and he looked at me. I was like 20 years old. And he looked at me and said, in his gruff manner, you the hunter kid? And I said, yes. He said, sit. 
So I sat and we talked and we got into talking about book collecting. And I said that one thing I wanted was the first edition of Henry Adams' History of the United States. And he said, oh, I have that. And I said, where'd you get it? And he said, from a friend of Henry Adams. And at that point, I realized the difference in our ages. 